Tonight, the National is in Dauphin, Manitoba, a small city trying to process so much loss. Why did it happen is just unbelievable. Public tragedy met with private grief after 15 people were killed in a crash. And can that intersection be made safer? I think we've kind of normalized to an extent how dangerous it can be. What WestJet's plan to shut down Sunwing could mean for you. Hopefully it's not our last flight. A new danger for Ukrainians unearthed by that destroyed dam, landmines. It's an OZM minefield, uh, which has explosives that will essentially leap into the air and then explode. CBC News is on the ground in Ukraine. This is The National with Ian Hanamansing in Dauphin, Manitoba. And we're just outside Dauphin City Hall where flags remain at half-mast tonight. The crash took the lives of 15 people from this community. Ten others were taken to hospital, most with critical injuries. And now Dauphin remains in a state of shock. There are messages of support and prayers, but for now, Dauphin's moments of sadness and remembrance are quiet and mostly behind closed doors. As Cameron McIntosh explains, it's hard for the city to move forward with so many details unsettled and questions unanswered. A somber Father's Day Sunday. Preparing for Mass, Father Michelle No is having trouble finding the words. What are people asking of you or what are people saying to you? Well, it's, there isn't uh, so much the words themselves that are is the most important thing. It's, it's the heaviness of the mood. The mood of a small prairie city shaken by an accident two hours down the highway, now marked by flowers that killed 15 local people still to be identified officially and left 10 more in hospital seriously injured. Outside another church, Manuel Nakanechny can't get his mind off it. It's just so hard to comprehend. He drives for the bus company involved in the crash and is a friend of the bus driver who police say was seriously injured. And I wake up in the middle of the night and it's just totally right there. There's just no getting away from it. Well, it's been horrible. I mean, most of the people, I either know them, two-thirds of the people that were on the bus, I know who they are. It's very sad. Inevitable comparisons have been made to the 2018 Humboldt Broncos crash that killed 16. The hockey team was a face and focus of the community, which rallied in a very public way. You really have 25 individual families who are grieving. Dauphin City Councillor Randy Daly says this feels different, more private, family focused. People aren't sure what to do, right? I mean, we, we don't have complete answers. All that we have. Back at St. Viator's, Father No says the community is still absorbing it all. How do you think the community moves forward then? I'm going to use the classic word, it's a mystery. But as it happens, we will deal with it as it happens. So Cam, no public event planned right now, but one could be coming. Yes, so City Council tomorrow is going to hold a meeting. On Tuesday, faith leaders in the community are going to have a meeting as well. The idea is a vigil or something along those lines would be appropriate. It's just the where and the when that needs to be worked out. And keep in mind here too that a lot of the families don't have a lot of information. Some of the bodies haven't been individually identified yet, so that makes things like planning funerals and memorials more complicated. Meanwhile, we're expecting an update from the RCMP tomorrow. All right, we're going to talk more with the mayor about that later. Thanks, Cam. Pleasure. And coming up, we'll take you to the intersection where the accident happened and show you why it and others like it pose such a challenge to drivers. Let's turn now to B.C., where tonight the province is battling the largest single wildfire in its history, and it's still growing. In just over five weeks, the Donny Creek fire has ripped through a vast area. If there's any good news, it's that the affected region in the northeast is sparsely populated. Still, this year's dry, windy spring made for an early and punishing wildfire season that's far from over. Susanna De Silva shows us how that is keeping people on edge. 
Sparks of lightning unleashed several raging fires that joined to create what is now the largest fire the province has ever seen. The temperature has been above seasonal. We've had winds which have been continuous. There are multiple reasons why this fire is the size it is. The fire is now over 530,000 hectares, a size even officials are struggling to describe. If you stretch the perimeter, you know, linearly, um, it would go from Fort St. John to Kamloops, which is a 10 and a half hour drive. It is also approaching the size of Prince Edward Island. While the fire is in an area sparsely populated, there are oil and gas operations and a critical road, the Alaska Highway. Crews have done some controlled burns to protect it, while officials in the Yukon are making plans to nail down other ways of getting essential goods. We can't, don't have much visibility today, maybe a kilometre, kilometre and a half visibility. Truck driver Robert Smith has been taking these photos as he works in the area. Oh, it's very dry. Some of the trees are even turning yellow already. That's how dry it is. We're definitely nervous around here. Like, it's just, they can't stop the fire because it's so dry. And I don't foresee any heavy rainfalls in our near future from what I've been hearing. Rain over the last few days has helped tame many fires in the province, like the one on Vancouver Island that cut off a main highway. And it's allowed residents of Tumbler Ridge to go home. But officials warn the rain is not doing enough. So it's uh, not actually really penetrating into those like deeper fuels, which are super dry. And um, BC is not alone in this. It's like a national kind of trend that we've seen with sort of drought. And as temperatures are expected to rise at the end of the week, so will the risk. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Canadian air travelers trying to save money will soon have one less option. Popular low-cost carrier Sunwing Airlines will be shut down after being acquired by WestJet. Jennifer Yoon looks at what that could mean for your next flight. After almost 20 years, the end of popular discount carrier Sunwing Airlines comes as an unhappy surprise to these travelers. I'm actually very surprised. That's really sad, actually. When shopping for a vacation, I saw that Sunwing had the best uh, prices out there. After acquiring Sunwing last month, an internal memo outlined WestJet executives' plans to shut down Sunwing and absorb its roots. A spokesperson for WestJet says Sunwing Vacations will continue to operate under the WestJet banner. As for Sunwing Airlines, operations are expected to shut down completely within two years. Just last week, WestJet announced it was folding discount carrier Swoop into its regular fleet. Planes are full, fares are high. Um, airlines are feeling much more comfortable in flexing their muscle to kind of uh, look at trying to consolidate, reduce the competition. This industry expert says it's bad news for consumers. We might be going down a slippery slope here of situations where carriers are consolidating, prices will go up, uh, and there might be a need for some uh, oversight to make sure that uh, consumers' uh, benefits, consumers' pricing doesn't go a little crazy. But not everyone agrees. I think at the end of the day, this is a good thing. This travel agent thinks the merger could actually reduce the delays and cancellations that plagued Sunwing for months. I think if they've got this big, strong fleet of aircraft available that they can move around, I think this will be better for the consumer and will be more seamless. Bear in mind that WestJet still has a major, big competitor in the business, and that's Air Canada. Just the latest shakeup in Canada's fiercely competitive airline industry as the busy travel season only ramps up. Jennifer Yoon, CBC News, Montreal. More political fallout is expected this week in New Brunswick after a policy meant to protect LGBTQ students was changed. As Kate McKenna shows us, the Premier's on the defensive, facing rebellion from inside his own caucus. Premier Blaine Higgs is downplaying, but not quite rejecting election speculation. I, I don't want to go to an election, and, and that isn't my intent to do that. It's been more than a week since he first floated a snap election. It, it potentially could call him force an election. Over an issue dividing New Brunswick and his own caucus. Would I do that? Uh, it's not without the realm of possibility. Earlier this month, the PC government announced a change to the Gender Identity Education Guidelines, known as Policy 713. Soon, students under 16 will need parental approval before changing their name and pronouns at school. Teens like Alex Harris say that risks harming students. 
And it actually made it easier for me to come out to my parents because I knew I had a safe space at school. And I appreciate, you know, that not all um, parents' uh, situation and children's situation are the same at home. Yeah. Uh, but the policies fundamental shouldn't um, kind of rule out all parents. The move prompted protests, including school walkouts. There were, I know, tons of people who were emailing and calling, including myself, all of the MLAs in New Brunswick to try to say, please don't change our policy. Internally, Higgs is facing a mini rebellion. Six members of his own caucus voted for an opposition motion calling for more consultation. And his Minister of Social Development resigned with this handwritten note saying, I can no longer remain in your cabinet. I have certainly, you know, voiced my concerns about some of our government's approaches to certain topics. And um, this policy 713 and the debate that ensued in the House really kind of was my, my last straw. But Higgs says he's pushing ahead anyway, arguing parents have a right to know what's going on with their kids. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with the Chinese Foreign Minister in Beijing, calling the talks candid and constructive. Blinken is the highest-ranking American diplomat to visit China in the last five years. Relations have been strained due to several issues, including the recent suspected Chinese spy balloons over U.S. airspace. The two agreed to meet again in Washington. Republican presidential hopefuls are getting louder about their criticism of Donald Trump, but supporters of the former president are demanding loyalty. As Katie Simpson shows us, it's getting messy on the campaign trail. Donald Trump's commanding lead has some of his distant presidential challengers turning to personal insults to try to slow his momentum. Loser, loser, loser. I'll think about Former New you. Jersey Governor Chris Christie is hoping the criticism will resonate and that Trump's okay. legal troubles will change the dynamics of this know, race. Man. That's not the conduct that we should have from someone who wants to be president of the United States again. We love Trump! Trump did nothing wrong. And there are no early signs Trump's support is wavering, even after he was formally charged with federal crimes over his handling of classified documents after leaving office. He provoked this whole problem himself. Yes, a case that is so remarkable, unfair, former Trump allies case. are now his openly questioning his fitness for office. Uh, he is a consummate narcissist, and he constantly engages in reckless conduct that, that puts uh, his political followers at risk and, and, and the conservative and Republican agenda at risk. But if anything, Trump continues to assert his dominance, demanding Republican challengers promise to grant him a pardon. If I have the great privilege of being president of the United States, as I did when I was a governor, uh, we, we would evaluate any request uh, for pardon. For well, hello, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis previously said he wouldn't rule out a Trump pardon either, while Senator Tim Scott dodged the question. Well, I'm not going to deal with the hypotheticals, but I will say that every American is innocent until proven guilty. All of this goes to show that Trump remains the core focal point of this race. It's his words and his actions that take up all of the oxygen in the campaign. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. In India, days of extreme heat have already claimed nearly 100 lives. Temperatures approached 45 degrees this weekend, made worse by the humidity. One hospital had more than 300 cases of heat-related illness. Many were people over 60 with conditions aggravated by extreme temperatures. In Uganda, funeral services were held today for the victims of an attack on a school. At least 41 were killed Friday night when a bomb set their dormitories on fire. Some students were attacked with machetes. Officials say a group of extremist rebels linked to ISIS is responsible. And a note about that school, it was built with the help of a BC-based nonprofit. Now to a go public investigation. A credit card customer was out thousands after signing up for a secured card that promises to help fix credit scores. But it left her worse off than when she started. And as Rosa Marcatelli tells us, her story takes another unexpected turn. We're looking at NSF fees, return checks. That's been the hardest part, is, is being charged an NSF fee. And when I, when I knew I could have had that money, that was my money. 
Constance McCall is one of thousands of Canadians who signed up for a secured visa through a company called Plastic. It promises to improve credit scores. Customers put down a security deposit to get the card, often people with poor credit. And when they cancel their cards, they're supposed to get that money back. $4,500 is not uh, a little amount of money, especially for someone like myself. The problem is there's no federal agency in charge of these kinds of secured credit cards, says this expert. They are not subject to the same uh, high level of requirements. I would argue there should be more protection. Hundreds of other plastic customers say they're also waiting for their deposits back. Plastic's owner says he's paying back what he can, but blames the bank he's partnered with, saying it's holding the money. Those funds are available to our customers if DC Bank does what they're contractually obligated to do. DC Bank says it does not hold security deposits for customers, and plastic needs to pay them back. Visa also takes no responsibility. And if that's not enough, Go Public uncovered more unhappy customers from Oma Bamadero's former business in used car sales. While you're getting into the credit card business, you are also breaking a consumer protection law with your used car business where you didn't pay off those liens. You know what I'm talking about. And that ruined those people's credit ratings. Well, that's, so what would you say to your plastic customers who hear that? That's actually not really what happened. So let me be very clear. Back um, when I had the car loan business or the car uh, company, uh, that deal was done in another office. So we had multiple offices and I as the owner, as a, a, a partner in the company, uh, have to, you always have to take responsibility. McCall says she wouldn't have signed up for a plastic visa if she'd known about the conviction. Here's what she told us. After GoPublic brought McCall's case to Alma Bamadero's attention, Plastic refunded her $4,500. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. We have more from Dauphin coming up, including a conversation with the mayor about what comes next. But first, questions about the site of Thursday's deadly collision. I think every intersection on the Trans-Canada Highway is dangerous. Why they're so difficult to navigate. And later. People don't talk about it, even within their own family. But Gavin Crawford is talking to us about his mother's Alzheimer's and the podcast it inspired. We're back in two. We're at the intersection between Highway 5 and the Trans-Canada. We know the bus stopped at this stop sign until the westbound lanes were clear, went to where the yield sign was, but for some reason drove right into the path of a semi-trailer that was heading eastbound. We don't want to get any closer to the intersection right now because we don't want to distract any drivers, but here's some video we took driving to this intersection. You can see there's a lot going on. There's a lot you have to pay attention to and judgments you have to make as you cross four lanes of highway traffic. And the decisions a driver makes at these stops are critical because highway speed traffic may have no time to react. They're known as at-grade intersections, very common along the Trans-Canada in the prairies. And as Ellen Morrow shows us, some drivers around here know their dangers all too well. How have you been feeling the past few days? Heavy. 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 Truck driver David Henry takes us to an intersection on a rural stretch of the Trans-Canada Highway just outside Winnipeg. So you're going 100 kilometers an hour and you got to make the turn onto here and do it with, without getting rear-ended by other vehicles. These crossings, known as at-grade intersections, are so common on the highway across the prairies. What do you think of intersections like this? You drive them all the time. I don't like them. I don't think we should have any, any intersections like this on the Trans-Canada Highway. I think it, it should all be uh, cloverleaf um, interchanges. But realistically, that's not going to happen. David has driven through Parbury, now scarred by this horror countless times. How did you feel when you found out that the crash happened at that particular intersection? Oh, it, it makes sense. Like, it, um, it's not a shock in that way, but to have so many people killed, that's horrible. 
15 people, most of them seniors, killed on their way to a nearby casino. The bus they were traveling in and a semi-truck colliding at this at-grade intersection. Police say the truck had the right of way, but there are few other details about the crash. Just standing here watching the traffic, it's so clear why this is such a difficult intersection to navigate. We've only been here for a few minutes and we've already seen a couple of near misses, including one where a tractor trailer truck was trying to cross on the other side of the highway like that truck just did behind me, but it blocked part of these lanes. So another truck had to veer quickly around it. The intersection has a history of tragedy. An elderly couple dead after a crash there in 2005. So many others injured over so many years. For Winnipeg musician Justin Van Dam, this latest crash dragged him back to the loss of his own grandparents. Percy and Noreen Shepard, their lives taken in a collision at a similar intersection just east of the Carberry disaster 24 years ago. My grandpa Percy, he was a former Anglican minister with a big booming voice and uh, a great sense of humor, very cheeky. And uh, my grandmother Noreen, um, she was a really kind woman and uh, just the two of them just so in love. How do you feel that it is that same stretch of road and a similar set of circumstances? When you see a trend of something negative happening, it's it's on policymakers to to address it. And I think we've kind of normalized to an extent how dangerous it can be. Local officials in Carberry have raised concerns about the intersection before. Calls are growing now for a redesign or traffic lights to improve safety. It's unclear if this crash will force any action. We always review the situation and we'll make, make sure that we do a study and to make sure, we do, you know, making sure that if there's anything else we can prove on in that intersection, we will definitely look at that. We head to the Manitoba Professional Truck Driving Championships days after the crash. Some of the province's best drivers navigating complicated skills challenges. What do they think of the highways they drive on every day? We have to be so much more on the ball than anybody on the road. Uh, just because of our weight, our length. There's not much you can really do about all the intersections. Dave Phillips has been a driver for 32 years. Having lights and flashing lights and stuff like that, I mean, you're talking billions of dollars because you would have to do them at every single intersection that crosses the highway. That reality means these intersections, the hazards that come along with them, are unlikely to change. There's, there's going to keep being fatalities. There's fatalities all around these highways. Nobody's really wanted to talk about it much. David Henry says many in the driving community are now struggling. Their hearts broken for both drivers and the lives lost in Carberry. It doesn't matter who's at fault. It doesn't matter. It's, it's going to be something they have to deal with for the rest of their life. It, it's really, really tough. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, near Winnipeg. We are back in Dauphin, and let's once again check in with the Mayor David Boziak. Uh, here we are, three full days after the crash, and we still don't know the names of the people, at least publicly, who have passed away. Right, that's one of the things that has been um, on our minds as uh, we're trying to determine how best to help the people that are grieving or need help. And uh, without people knowing publicly, who the deceased are or who the injured are. It's been a little slow for us to, in terms of planning, but I guess that's just, that's the way we'll have to deal with it as, as the situation unfolds. Yeah, you know, you said something on Friday that I've heard other mayors say in other situations, there is no playbook for this. Right. And, and this is unfolding differently, for example, than, uh, than Humboldt unfolded in terms of things being private. But grieving is happening. It's just happening in smaller pockets. That, that's, that's what we're hearing and, and the people that we've been in contact with in the community have expressed uh, that sentiment that um, it's happening in smaller pockets with the uh, people that they're very close to. I know that our ministerial association had some special uh, parts of their 
uh, Sunday services that dealt with uh, the situation uh, that happened this week. And it, it appears that everybody is getting the help they need right now. I know that um, in our preparations, we were wondering how does the community respond because it seems the RCMP are doing a great job of communicating with the individual families that have been involved and our responsibility is more, I'll call it secondary or tertiary, the more broader community of Dauphin and how do we help them. Yeah, and, and you're still trying to figure that That's out. Right. I, I heard an interesting conversation in City Hall just a few minutes ago where somebody was saying that maybe it's the age of the people who have passed away, maybe it's the culture of a small town. For some, whatever reason, people seem reluctant to kind of seek help in terms of counseling, let's say, or therapy, but then some dogs came in and people just opened up. Right, right, and, th and, that, and that could be a cultural thing, it could be an age thing, and it could be the notion that, you know, I've, that I felt since Friday that we are a community that's coming together, and it may not be publicly or very overtly, but there are people getting the supports they need or seem to need right now. We're more concerned about, you know, might it be just a delayed response? And might something this week that we have to respond to in a in a broader or bigger way but we feel prepared um, i've been telling people the last couple of days that i'm surrounded by competency um, tremendous staff at city hall our, our council the community groups and organizations so overall we seem that we're doing everything that we've needed to do so far and hopefully it's met the, the needs of those who need us most there's a sculpture outside your city hall to the resilience of ukrainian women and i and i do feel like your town is going to need that sense of resilience over the next few days so so good luck thank you very much appreciate it just ahead less than two weeks after the destruction of a ukrainian dam there are concerns that what the water left behind could be very dangerous our margaret evans shows us the mounting frustration Problems are emerging after the recent dam collapse that flooded the Ukrainian city of Kherson. That disaster now threatens crucial food and water supplies, even efforts to remove deadly Russian landmines. CBC News has a team on the ground in the region, and our Margaret Evans found scenes of danger and determination. Alina Stasko, fresh from the sodden shores of Kherson, with one bag and no idea what her future holds. There is some comfort in the form of neighbors who fled the floodwaters ahead of her, heading for this center for the displaced in Mykolaiv. We first met her at the train station. Russians were shooting at us from the east bank, she says, describing her escape after the Kahovka Dam was destroyed. Ukraine pushed Russian troops out of the city last November but only as far as the other side of the Dnipro River. We were living under occupation for eight months, said Stasko. And after the liberation, we were shelled every day. My soul is screaming, she says. Not just for herself. Victims on the Russian-held side of the flood zone have remained largely out of reach. And even here in Mykolaiv, an hour's drive away from the front, the need is great. Drinking water is still bussed in to collection points like this one, a year after Russian troops destroyed the city's main water line. Nerves are frayed. Please tell the world what's happening, says Larisa Dorhalist. Ukrainians are being killed, just destroyed. To the east of Mykolaiv, on what was once rich farmland, minesweepers are at work, a slow and steady ballet. This region was also occupied by the Russians. The Halo Trust, a demining charity, has been at work here since they were pushed out. The flood is a huge setback. It takes patience, it takes time. Jasmine Dan, a Canadian, says the danger is that Russian-laid mines will have shifted with the force of the flood. We were almost done this minefield. Uh, we've been working here for a few months now. It's an OZM minefield, uh, which has explosives that are on tripwire um, that will essentially leap into the air and then explode. It was already going to take decades to clear Ukraine of mines. 
The added complications the floodwaters have brought to the demining process here are clear, but they're not the only legacy the destruction of the dam has left behind for future generations to grapple with. The Kohovka Reservoir, about 95 kilometers upstream from the dam. It's shrinking fast, water levels down by 70%, a blow to surrounding wildlife and to some 700,000 people who rely on it for water. Andrei Selitsky is the military administrator for Nova Voronsovka, a town on the reservoir. Retreating waters are revealing the detritus of conflicts, present and past. It's very dangerous now. Old mine for Second World War and uh, uh, Grad, Oregon uh, mine in this war. The most immediate problem, though, is still drinking water. Bottles of it are now being trucked in and rationed. For farmers used to working in a green belt supplied by the reservoir, the problem is more complicated. Denis Miranenko grows strawberries and grapes. If we irrigate with only what nature gives us, it will not grow, he says. In the summer, the climate is very dry, it's very hot, and so the harvest won't be here at all. Some experts warn without drastic action, this part of Ukraine could become desert-like. But in a country still at war, even temporary solutions are difficult to contemplate, leaving an ecosystem already battered by conflict more precariously perched than ever. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Southern Ukraine. Just ahead, Gavin Crawford has created some of the funniest characters in Canadian comedy. Now he weaves a little humor with heartbreak in a very personal podcast. I guess it's made me a little less afraid about talking about things that are sad. The inspiration behind his podcast about his mom's Alzheimer's. I love podcasts, but I have an annoying habit of always recommending them to my friends. So with that in mind, I suggest you listen to Gavin Crawford's Let's Not Be Kidding. I'm going to chat with him in just a moment, but first, here's Gavin's life in 30 seconds. Because here at CBC, we like comedies, even if they're funny. Gavin Crawford came to national attention during his eight-year run on This Hour Has 22 Minutes. The comedian from Tabor, Alberta, has a knack for creating memorable characters. Hey, I'm Mark Jackson at the Waterkeeper Celebrity Ski Event, because nothing raises the awareness of the environment more than watching celebrities ski all over it. Currently, as the host of Because News on CBC Radio, Crawford moderates a quiz show where laughs are more important than facts. It just depends on if you go with science or philosophy. <laughs> it's Alberta, so neither. <laughs> There's some humor in his new podcast, too, but it's certainly not front and center. Let's Not Be Kidding has all of the emotions, as Crawford and some of his talented friends detail the pain and absurdity of dealing with a loved one's dementia. I spoke to Gavin Crawford at the Because News studio in Toronto. Gavin, thank you very much for sitting down with me. Your podcast is fantastic. Oh, I, I, I love it so much. And, and let's be clear, this is not a comedy. I mean, no, it's not, uh, you know, it's called Let's Not Be Kidding for a reason because you know, it's, uh, it's a sad thing, and I don't want anyone to think like, hey, I made this funny thing where I'm making fun of my mom's Alzheimer's, ha ha, look at all this stupid thing she does. It's not that, um, you know, but there is elements that you can find just in the pure absurdity of that kind of um, disease coupled with, you know, sort of very long grief. Anyone that's gone through a process of like, you know, I call it long grief. My mom used to sort of go in and out of knowing who I was. Occasionally she would mistake me for my dad, which was fine, just for a minute though. But it started to happen more and more for longer periods of time. My whole MO as a person in the world and as a professional, the only thing I ever really knew how to do was to see kind of horrible things and hold up a funhouse mirror to them and 
you know, distort them in just enough of a way that it makes it silly or ridiculous or absurd and, you know, helps either other people get through that horrible situation or to look at a situation in a different way or just, you know, in the terms of like you know, personal survival helps me just not get beat up in the schoolyard, uh, you know, so uh, it's a very strong defense mechanism that I can now use as an offense mechanism. But she would always play innocent. It was her favorite thing to do. I remember my sister walked in kind of bedraggled after a party one time. And my mom, there was a lot of people sitting in the living room. And my mother just said, wow, you look like you've been rode hard and put away wet. And everyone was kind of like, mom. And she's like, you know, what? Like a horse, you know. But you could tell from the twinkle in her eye, she knew what she was saying. It's a podcast about a lot of things, primarily Alzheimer's and dementia, but it's also obviously a podcast about your mom. Let's Not Be Kidding is the perfect title for it, not just because it kind of captures the, the sensibility of the podcast, but it also tells us a little bit about her wry view of the world. Yeah, I mean, my mom was complicated in a way because she, she had um, you know, many different sides. She was very shy, but she was also incredibly um, independent and like super brave and could do anything she wanted. She liked things that were a little bit odd and weird, which was lucky for me because I was both. <laughs> and um, yeah, and she just, I mean, let's not be kidding was one of, you know, she had many little catchphrases, but that was one she would say when, that was how she would let you know that she sort of saw the full picture. If you, I, like if I had a friend in, in junior high who was a bit of a badass, <laughs> and you know, I would be like, oh, can I hang out with so-and-so? And she'd be like, yeah, yeah, but don't go to the mall with them because you know let's not be kidding <laughs> and then you're like oh yeah right she knows he steals yeah. um <laughs> uh, she would just let you know uh that she knew the lay of the land but she wasn't really like a smack talker so she would just kind of leave it there what topic apparently does not warrant a public inquiry galen weston's bank account <laughs> <laughs> nothing to see here <laughs> So let's talk about this show a little bit. And, and I wonder, it's a challenging time for me in the news business, uh, you know, a time of a lot of ugliness in the news, a lot of, uh, you know, people like, like sort of a, a deep divide, especially in the United States. How hard is it these days to parody the news? Uh, I mean, sometimes it's hard because sometimes it's just an actual parody of itself. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, other times, it's a gift because things are patently absurd and you can really lean into that. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an impossible task to do a news comedy right now, uh, but it also always has been uh, an impossible task to do any comedy because everyone thinks they know what's funny and anything that they don't think is funny, they're 100% uh, sure is not funny and should never have been said. And um, how dare anyone say that? I mean, the difference now is they can let the world know in a tweet within seconds. Yeah, I mean, but you know, Twitter, social media, all I just take with a grain of salt. Yeah. Like, it's just a different medium. I mean, people have said, I, I, I've been in this business for a long time. I've had terrible letters saying like, you know, it's so unfortunate that you didn't die of AIDS yet from like back in the 1990s. Wow. Now I just get them in a tweet. So, you know, and I'm like, block, block, block. I always say with Because News, like, you know, we just try to be silly about everything, but it, it's a no-win situation. In the same episode, I'll make a terrible, I'll, well, not a terrible joke, uh, or maybe a maybe terrible joke, I don't know. But like in the very same episode, we'll like do a fairly hard joke about something Trudeau did, you know, uh, that will get a oof from the studio audience. And, you know, and then uh, later on in the episode, there will be like a polyab joke and the same thing. And, you know, people will listen to the whole episode and, both people will write in and be like, you would never say anything bad about Justin Trudeau. But I just did. <laughs> and then, you know, the same people will be like, yeah. why, are you, why are you hitting yeah. Justin Trudeau so hard when you don't say anything about yeah. Polyev? And you're like, literally in the same episode, there is a hard joke about each, mm -hmm. but they don't, for whatever reason, they, don't, they only hear, you know, the thing that they want to get mad about. And all I can do is serve up both and I guess take which dish that they, you know, Take. With the podcast, you, you let us into your life, and, uh, and, and so we know what a grueling journey this was for, for everyone in your family as your mother dealt with dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, has it 
changed you? And, and I, I mean, I think particularly, you know, you have a lot of creative years ahead of you um, as an artist. D do you think differently about that now after all that you've been through? Well, I mean, I know I'm probably not going to remember any of it, so it doesn't, it makes things matter less. So that, uh, you're making a joke, but would, would, are you joking about... Well, I mean, let's not be kidding. It's runs in the family. I'm a lot like my mother. It's either me or my other sister. We both know. So we're just hoping for some scientific advancements at this point. I mean, that's the thing. Everyone you talk to, everyone I spoke with on the podcast, it's all in our mind because you watch the person going through it. And my mother's mother went through it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she knew what was happening as it was happening because she had been through it with her own mother. And, you know, had 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 conversations with me, like, if that is to me, like, you know, get the pillow. And you're like, rum, write that down because I can't, <laughs> you know. And then later on, you know, 20 years later, you're sitting there and thinking about, like, rolling back to that conversation, being like, oh, does she, is she, is she I know she said what she said. And then you're like, okay, well, I can't, <laughs> I'm not getting the pillow. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's changed me in a way of I'm going to write a few things down uh, about the future. Uh, so I don't know. I, has it changed me? Uh, I guess it's made me a little less afraid about talking about things that are sad. And it's also changed how I deal with people who are going through loss or experiencing loss because I know now that if someone's like, oh, yeah, I'm having a really hard time with this or my, you know, my father's in the hospital or whatever, that... I can say like, oh, that's that's too bad, but then also, you know, make a joke or tell a funny story because I know from being on the other side of it, what they don't want is like an outpouring of like, oh, I don't know how to deal with you. Uh, you know, uh, better to just, you know, meet them where they are. And, you know, they're already going through it. So you can be sarcastic and you can be supportive and you can basically be normal. I learned a lot listening to your podcast and, and it's allowed me to have conversations that I otherwise wouldn't have. And uh, I think you've done a great service. And occasionally it was funny too. So. Yeah, well, hopefully there is, there is a bit of that. I mean, people don't talk about it even within their own families, I think, when you're going through. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice piece of work. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think my favorite part of that interview was the last answer because I think Gavin was kind of reluctant to go to that topic of what he thinks about in terms of Alzheimer's and, and the future. And like a lot of comedians, great insight, but a little bit of deflection as well. Lawnmowers are a popular gift for Father's Day, but not like the one a Windsor, Ontario man now has, and he's thrilled with it. Our moment is coming up. This is Rob Piper in his brand new lawnmower, built so he could use it with his wheelchair. It was a class project by technology students at a high school in Windsor, Ontario. Rob used to love cutting his grass, but five years ago, a cycling accident left him in a wheelchair. The students answered his call for independence, and tonight, their custom creation, a gift to Rob, is our moment. Oh my God, I'm so excited. The boys and girls did an amazing job on it ready to go cut the whole neighborhood. I was crying on the inside, but didn't show it on the outside. I don't like asking for help, this is my big thing. So grateful that they've done this for me. They're absolutely amazing. I can't believe the, the, the way they just stepped up and, and did this for them. Uh, we started uh, last semester last year, so it's been about a year now since we started. Just researching a little bit of online ideas and then we sat down as a group of students and myself and we started to begin to engineer a couple designs. I can't say enough about the students. They never stopped, they never lost interest. They stepped up. You know, cutting grass is one thing, what's next? Maybe a snowplow? <laughs> Well, uh, lots of students over multiple years uh, that were working on that project is a fantastic thing to be doing in a technology class. That is the National for Sunday, June 18th from Dauphin, Manitoba. As families come forward, if they are willing to come forward to talk about relatives who passed away in that collision, we are ready to tell their stories. That is likely to come in the days ahead. Have a good night.